I, I would like to, to welcome uh, Professor John Bergs from the University of Bergen, who is going to tell us something very important, which is, uh, I reckon, essential for all of us ecologists who look at nature, try to understand nature first by observing patterns and then trying to understand what may have caused these patterns. So I reckon it's absolutely essential first to look at how these patterns in the first place came to be. And for that, we need to look back at past changes. So John, please, I pass you the, the floor and uh, we look very much forward to your uh, uh, lecture. Uh, thank you, Laszlo, and thank you for the invitation. I'm going to talk about what's been called Quaternary Botanists, Quaternary Botany's major conundrum. Now you might, to understand that, we firstly, obviously, I'm going to consider what is a conundrum. Then because you're ecologists, I'm going to tell you a little bit of Quaternary background and some evolutionary background. Then we consider the questions of speciation in the Quaternary, the last 2.7 million years, persistence and adaptation, extinction, or the evolutionary process of stasis, and then what has actually gone on in the Quaternary, namely migration, a few conclusions, and some future directions. So a conundrum, it's a rather fine word. It means a riddle, a hard question, a dilemma, something that's very difficult to deal with, uh, a puzzle which is difficult or impossible to solve. In other words, a big problem, and it may not be possible to solve it, but in this talk, I shall try to give it a try. Now, because the Quaternary Botanical Literature has its own terminology, there are certain terms that, or abbreviations that I will use. And so these are, this is thousands of years, millions of years. BP means before present, which is actually 1950 in the common era. LG, last glacial, last glacial maxima, we'll talk a lot about those. What we live in, the post glacial or the Holocene. UVB, I shall talk about, solar ultraviolet radiation. Q time, which is an abbreviation just for the time of the quaternary. And we should also mention so called marine isotope stages. So the quaternary as background, it's the last 2.6 million years of Earth's history. And it's been a time of very marked climatic and environmental changes. Large terrestrial ice sheets started to form in the Northern Hemisphere about 2.75 million years, resulting then in a series of multiple glacial and interglacial cycles, which we now know were driven by variations in the orbital insulation on timescales named after the mathematician who worked at Milankovitch of 400, 100, 41 and 19 to 23,000 years. So there's a sort of a consistency, a cyclicity. Glacial conditions account for up to 80% of the quaternary period and the remaining 20% consist of the shorter interglacial periods where conditions were similar to or slightly warmer than the present day. So we are living in an interglacial. Now this is a record going back for 55 million years based on iso oxygen isotopes in deep sea cores, which are an indirect record of the amount of global ice. And so the red are warm periods and the blue are cold periods. They, so you see, as we go through the tertiary, the climate is generally cooling. Then when we reach the quaternary or the Pleistocene, you see the number of uh, blue cold periods are progressively increasing. Those are the glacials and these little spikes are the interglacials, what we live in today. 
So at a more detailed level over 450,000 years, global ice volume, you see, so when this is expressed as the sea level, when you've got low values like here, which is a glacial period, high, which reflects high ice volumes, uh, then we see uh, that the carbon dioxide was correspondingly low. So here it's where we are today and how carbon dioxide is progressively increasing due to human activity. So what we have now is at least 17 glacial phases, nine of them in the last 700,000 years, and we can see the last four of them in ice cores from the Antarctica. So when I was a student, we were taught that the Quaternary was a million years. Now we know it's 2.6 million years and that about 125,000 years for each of these glacial interglacial cycles. So interglacials are between 10 and 30,000 years long, glacials 70 to 100,000 years. And there tends to be an asymmetry in that it tends to get coldest right at the end of the glaciation. And as I showed you the isotope records from these marine foraminifera show that for 90% of the last 450,000 years there's been more ice than today. So really what we live in, the Holocene, the present post-glacial, is simply the latest interglacial and it's 11,700 years. So we have to accept that the glacial environment is the norm and that interglacial is what we live in are unstable interruptions. Now, unlike the Paleogene and the Neogene, the periods that came before the Quaternary, there is only a relatively short time, about 10,000 years, for vegetation and soil to develop in one of our interglacials. So it's a rather short time compared with the length of the glaciers. Now, why there were glaciations, as I say, the Milankovitch cycles, They've been called the pacemaker of the ice ages, but you also needed mountain building and also plate tectonics. The glacial conditions, we have large terrestrial ice sheets in the north and on high mountains, widespread frozen ground or permafrost south of the ice and relic soils in southern Europe. Temperatures 10 to 25 degrees lower than at present day and high aridity, high dryness, and temperatures two to five degrees lower at low latitudes. And global atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations lower as low as 180 parts per million, rising to pre-industrial levels of 280 parts per million. And there were very steep climatic gradients across Europe and Asia during the last glacial mass. So this is a schematic diagram of Europe. I'm afraid many of my examples are from Europe. Ice, then south of the ice, there was then tundra going progressively into steppe and then small areas of forest in and around the Mediterranean basin. And this is an artist's impression of what it would have looked like with large vertebrates grazing and a variety of plants of, that you, today you would find in mountains or in very dry areas. And this picture taken in Iran is a possible landscape it would have looked like in Central Europe. Open dry steppe with lots of Artemisia and Amaranthaceae and lots of windblown lurse, very fine silt. Now that's the quaternary background, now the evolutionary background. Now in Darwin's On the Origin of Species where he discusses geographic distributions and an extended commentary on the effects of the great glacial period, he suggests that plants and animals spread southwards during times of increasing cold and then spread back north during the following climate warming. And you've got to remember, 
and Darwin's day, the idea of multiple ice ages was by no means established. And so he wrote the Arctic forms during their long southern migration and remigration northward will have been exposed to nearly the same climate and is especially to be noticed. They will have kept in a body together. Consequently, their mutual relationships will not have been much disturbed and in accordance with the principles inculcated or discussed in this volume, they will not have been liable to much modification. So Darwin already realized that species were changing during these cold periods, but he came up with the idea that they ch hadn't changed because they stayed together and so always experienced the same environment. So this the most significant part of Darwin's passage is this idea that things, climate changes, would not have caused modification because species shifted their distributions, so they remained together. And as we shall see, what the quaternary record, the botanical record in particular, shows is that this did not occur, that species responded individualistically, differently, and created assemblages in the past with no modern analogues today. And as we are seeing, will create assemblages in the future with no current analogues today either. So the major theme in Darwin's great work was how to link the processes you could see today to patterns in the fossil record to give us a coherent theory of evolution. And Darwin's link was challenged by the paleobiologist Niels Eldridge and the late Stephen Jay Gould, with the view the fossil record showed long, long periods of little change into space with brief periods of rapid change, what they called punctuated equilibria. And that's when speciation took place through geographical isolation, allopatric and peripatric speciation. So Gould proposed an evolutionary theory that had three separate levels of time. Ecological moments, natural selection, geological time in millions of years, speciation through geographical isolation, isolation, and then mass extinctions. Now the fossil record clearly shows us that once diversification began on a major scale in the Cambrian, it was not continuous. There were periods of dramatic increase into space by sometimes of major setbacks or periods of relative stasis or stability. So they saw, this is Gould and that's Niles Eldridge, <clears throat> the history of diversity is one of radiations and stabilizations punctuated by mass extinctions. And they called this their punctuated equilibrium. So this is how Gould saw it. The first level microevolutionary change through natural selection, what Darwin was concerned about, geographical isolation due to uh, tectonics, creation of islands, and this would lead to speciation, mainly by isolation, hence allopatric speciation. And then, of course, and we now know at about every 26 million years, mass extinctions with loss of species and high attacks. So, is this a complete picture? What about the quaternary? What about quaternary oscillations? Now, the quaternary has been long assumed to be an important period for genetic diversification and speciation. And it was based on the premise, and this I was taught as a student way back in the 1960s, was that quaternary climate conditions favored the isolation of populations and hence led to allopatric speciation. So this basic idea of quaternary ice age speciation had these had two assumptions, that the responses to climate change during the quaternary were significantly different from those of other periods in Earth's history, and that the mechanisms of isolation during the quaternary were sufficient in time and space for genetic diversification to result in speciation. 
So what can our quaternary paleobiological record tell us about speciation, extinction, adaptation, and migration in quaternary time? So what effects did these ice ages with multiple long glacial stages and intervening short periods have on quaternary biology? And I, I'm only discussing, I'm only qualified to discuss plants and the quaternary of Europe and North America. So I apologize that there's absolutely nothing about uh, South America. So speciation. Now, despite the enormous advances in phylogenetics using DNA of ex present extinct and the development of many evolutionary trees, there is, as far as I know, little or no evidence for plant speciation during the last two million years. Now, it must have occurred, for example, to create the numerous neo-endemics that we get in tropical and mountainous areas, but there are no available data. Now, there are two explanations, possible explanations. Firstly, our fossil data are incomplete. They're based largely on pollen, and so pulses of genetic diversification and speciation would simply go unrecorded in the fossil record. And here molecular techniques are potentially valuable, but they need a well-calibrated molecular clock. The other explanation is that the isolation in these cold stages, the glacial phases, was simply too short in time for these speciation events. So you might say, well, why don't we go to deep time before the quaternary to see what was happening? Now, the deep time records for the last 410 million years show an average, the average duration of a fossil flowering plant species is about three and a half million years. And new species occur about every 0.4 million years. So that's one new species every 10% of an average species lifetime. So speciation events will occur on average about once in every 760,000 generations. So it's therefore quite possible that there's no apparent increase in speciation rates in the quaternal because the duration of geographic isolation was simply too brief especially for trees. The period would be about 70 to 100,000 years, and these simply isn't long enough. So therefore, it's important to consider speciation patterns not in the quaternary, but over the much longer period of the last 50 million years, the onset of what we call current ice house earth. So here, some work by Kathy Willis and Carl Niklas shows the Origin, origination rate of vascular plants from 400 million years to today. And we see that the angiosperms about 40 million years ago really started to speciate. Extinctions, we see a similar peak of extinctions, but of the gymnosperms and the pteridophytes, the conifers and the ferns at about the same time. And these, was, these were occurring this is a climate curve for the last 70 million years. We, this, these extinctions were beginning to occur as ice was building up in the Southern Hemisphere. So this, at the scale of one to two million years, we're simply not, our data are not good enough to detect these sorts of patterns. Now you've got to remember that Ice house earth, glacial ice earth, is not confined to the quaternary. So over the last 600 million years, there have been at least three intervals of ice house earth with widespread continental glaciation, global cooling, and increased dryness. And they're at the Cambrian, the Carboniferous, and in the Cenozoic the tertiary. So are these speciation rates during these ice house intervals different to those in the, the greenhouse period? 
So here again, another plot from Kathy Willis and Carl Nicholas. This is speciation rates. And we see that speciation rates greatly increased during these ice house periods. And this may have resulted from environmental changes operative on timescales much longer than our Milankovitch cycles. For example, elevated ultraviolet B levels associated with mountain uplift and with volcanism. And here, Kathy and I have calculated, this is for the last 50 million years, the amount of UVB in the summer that would be received on the Tibetan plateau. So you see from 50 million years up to the present day, it has greatly increased as the plateau has been uplifted in response to Himalayan. So, and the endemic plants that one finds on the Tibetan plateau are very much at high elevation. And the late John Fenley had this very nice diagram. This is showing how lowland vegetation, this is the distribution of lowland species. In a warm phase, they come up the mountain. And this is with normal ultraviolet B, which is highest at high elevations and decreases. Whereas in a cool phase, the lowland species are forced down. They now mix. So you get a mixing. And of course, because of the volcano, there's greater ultraviolet radiation. So not much evidence, zero evidence, in fact, for speciation. So what about persistence and adaptation? Now, many plant populations today show some sort of differentiation along latitudinal or elevational gradients. And so this probably occurred during glacial and interglacial stages. So is there any quaternary paleobotanical evidence for persistence, evolutionary adaptation, or phenotypic, phenotypic plasticity? Now there are, in terms of persistence, some very long-lived trees greater than 100 uh, 100 a thousand years these are all conifers this is the bristle cone pine pinus longiva in the white mountains of california and they have tolerated a huge range of environmental changes <clears throat> some tree populations have persisted in their last glacial maximum hideout or refugium for example here the vikos gorge in central greece which supports nearly every northern and central European tree species today, plus endemic Greek plants on the cliffs. And some trees, like Tilia cordata, may persist vegetatively for possibly a thousand plus years. It's got no known pathogens and is potentially immortal. Adaptation and plasticity is, a, is the shift of a population towards a phenotype that best fits the current environment and thus aids long-term persistence. Such changes must have been frequent in quaternary time, but we have no evidence to demonstrate adaptation over quaternary time. What available genetic and DNA evidence for adaptation only covers at the best 25 years. So given current techniques and the taxonomic and morphological limitations with our fossil pollen and macrofossil seeds and fruits, we cannot identify adaptive evolutionary shifts or on phenotypic plasticity, let alone assess the potential importance of in situ persistence. We have good evidence from many European trees of genotypic variation today, but the challenge now is to try to follow that present day trend backwards in time, as has been done so brilliantly with hominids, with other mammals, and with the water flea Daphne. So now we reach the alternative, extinction of the quaternary. Now, extinction is increasingly used in titles of papers and books in ecology, biogeography, etc. But people never define what type of extinction is being discussed or predicted. 
and Estella Leopold distinguished three main types, blanket extinction, partial extinction, and regional extinction or exterminations or extirpations. So blanket and partial are true extinctions. So the blanket is when you lose a complete phy phyletic line, like a genus or a family. Partial is when you lose a species for good. And regional is when you have an extermination of a taxon from one area, but continues to occur in another area. So given the rapid and frequent changes between glacial and interglacial stages, one would expect many blanket extinctions of entire genera or families, numerous partial extinctions in living genera, and of course, very many regional extinctions. So what does the quaternary record shows us? Well, it, here I'm excluding extinctions clearly due to human activity, like the Easter Island palm. Oops. Now, to understand extinctions, we need to use not pollen, which is rather crude, but plant macrophosphorus, seeds and fruits, and because they, they can often be identified at a greater taxonomic level. So this is a compilation. It's a rather complicated thing, but going from the late tertiary through into the early quaternary to the middle Pleistocene. And these are the different interglacial stages and brilliant work done in Poland and Belarus using macrofossils has shown that, in fact, there's only been in the Quaternary, up to the middle Quaternary, one blanket extinction. Various partial extinctions and, of course, some regional extinctions. So one blanket extinction, many partial extinction, extinct taxa, but they're nearly all aquatic plants. And by the Masovian, only five partial extinctions, all aquatics. So it's a small number of regional extinctions in these interglacials, and these are plants that today mainly occur in Southeast Asia or Eastern North America. There is, of course, this spectacular example in southeastern United States, the partial extinction of Picea crichfeldii, which occurred between about 16 and 10,000 years ago. It was in places like uh, Georgia, Mississippi, and so on, and it probably occurred as a result of rapid climate change. So glacial stages, they're highly dynamic with cold, dry periods and much variability. And these fluctuations during glacial stages may have been responsible for some of these extinctions. As regards European trees, here we are going again from the tertiary. This is the progressive loss of taxa. This is now the onset of the quaternary. And so in Northwest Europe, there'd have been 91 uh, tree taxa in the Miocene and only about eight today. And there are those that are now regionally extinct in Europe, but they nearly all occur in North America or Asia. There are some that hang on in Southern Europe. And then these are the widespread trees and shrubs in Europe today. And when we look, as Jens Christian Svenning has done, at these widespread relict and regionally extinct, they actually differ in their climatic tolerances today. So widespread taxa tolerate mean temperatures less than zero. Taxa with a tolerance greater than two and a half are either regionally extinct or relictual. And then the relictual taxa occur where there's more, a certain amount of precipitation. Of course, the other type of regional extinction or extermination is the alpine plants, the mountain plants at, in the last glacial maximum. And these are familiar alpines, commonly found as fossils, but nowadays are mainly in the mountains. And of course, these, <clears throat> I'm afraid, are all North European taxa. But one of the most spectacular is this 
minute member of the polygonaceae, it actually occurs, I've seen it in Patagonia, it also occurs in Terra del Fuego, is Conigia Icelandica. The yellow is its present day distribution. The blue circles are its late glacial. And you see it was actually, this is the extent of the ice. It was growing south of the ice, <coughs> pardon me, in Central Europe. And I've spent many an hour thinking, well, it must occur in the Alps, but I haven't, nobody has ever managed to find it. There are quite surprising extinctions in the Holocene for no obvious reason. Uh, trees from Spain, trees in the Swedish mountains, aquatic plants, and the common Scots pine from Ireland and from many of the Scottish islands. So what is this one plant that has actually suffered total extinction in the Quaternion? Mean, it's a thing called Arictites interglacialis, and it was found in interglacial deposits, three interglacials back in Poland, Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, Finnish Lapland and England. Nobody is even sure what family of plant it belongs to. The most likely one is that it's possibly Heresy. These are the seeds that have been found and it occurs with plants that you associate with acid bogs today. So it is the one example we have of a totally extinct so therefore, when we look at extinctions, we've got very few partial extinctions. We've got one blanket extinction, but of course many regional extinctions at various geographic scales. Why is this? Well, climate change within the glacial stage or the glacial interglacial transition, abrupt climate changes within an interglacial, or as we're finding out from the ice cores, more climatic variability within glacial or interglacial stages. Now this is where the quaternary record contrasts totally with forecasts about plant responses to future global warming, with wide, which predict widespread regional extinctions and several partial or blanket extinctions predicted for the coming decades. So that's the major conundrum. Uh, why do the plants not go extinct during all those glacial interglacial changes? So what we're forced with is that the evolutionary process is stasis. There's no evidence for speciation, but it probably occurred to give us these many micro species in the Southern Alps or in the South African Cape. There's no evidence for long-term persistence in situ, except in southern refugia, no adaptation for ad evidence for adaptation, but it must have occurred, and weak evidence for blanket extinction, some partial extinction, and much evidence for regional extinction. So given little speciation or extinction, stasis must be the major response in evolutionary terms for the quaternary in its multiple ice ages. <coughs> So species and lower categories may have appeared and persisted for longer or shorter periods, but the evidence is lacking. And we're uncertain, we just don't know if the frequency of speciation has or has not changed relative, say, to the tertiary. Species have clearly persisted unchanged, at least in morphological terms, over multiple glacial interglacial cycles. So stasis exists despite considerable environmental change. It's the major evolutionary response to the quaternary climate changes. And this stability of species through these oscillations is totally amazing. Because you think it, because it's occurring in the most unlikely circumstances where you would have expected lots of extinction lots of speciation as I was taught as a student and so as Sherlock Holmes this is a quote that Keith Bennett found is there any point to which you would wish to draw my attention said Dr Watson to the curious incidents of the dog in the night time 
but the dog did nothing in the night time, said Dr. Watson. That was the curious incident, remarked Sherlock Holmes. So if stasis is the overriding evolutionary process, what are the overriding ecological processes that cause changes in quaternary pollinators? And this is rain shifts, spread, migration. I don't like the word migration because it's not annual. It's not like annual bird migration. So I prefer to just call it spread. So to detect, to detect rain shifts, we need spatial geographical arrays of pollen data for particular time intervals. And the pioneer of pollen analysis, the Swedish geologist von Post, his motto was think horizontally, act vertically. And so we, even back in 1924, he was making maps. These show the relative abundance of spruce pizza pollen at different time periods. The larger the circle, the, the higher the values. And Brian Huntley and I, to stop it for a second, uh, in, published an atlas in 1983 based on sites, all the sites across Europe at that stage. And we extracted the data from the literature. And so if I started, this is 13,000 years, 12, you now see the spread. This is of oak across Europe, 9,000, 7,000. Or for the case of Fargus, the beach, And more, more recently, Simon Brewer and Thomas Giesek have constructed on a much bigger data set than we had, uh, dot maps. So I'm going to show you firstly Quercus, and this is at every 500 year intervals. And you'll see the dots start to get more common as it's spreading. So then we're now at 10,000 years, 8,000. Five thousand two thousand and today, and then similarly for Fagus, the beach, very scattered, twelve thousand, ten thousand. So the, the more detailed maps show the same patterns that Brian and I found, but shows much greater variation from one time to the other. Now, of course, our contours that Brian and I drew tend to smooth out variation. And the new maps of Simon Brewer and Thomas Giesek show much more variability from site to site and from time to time. Other ways of displaying patterns are spread. This is what I called isochrome maps. This is the time at which the pollen values, this is for oak, Quercus in the British Isles, showed times of arrival. So nine and a half, nine, eight and a half. And then it slows down as it gets towards its northern limit in Scotland. Or Fargus that came in late and then spread and reached this far by a thousand years ago. So from these maps, we can estimate rates of spread. And so you see this is in meters per year. And these are quite staggering rates of spread of trees, you know, a thousand meters per year for a, a hazelnut. So how on earth did trees do this? And this led to what's called Reed's paradox. He calculated that for an oak tree, it would need a million years to reach southern Scotland without some help from 
birds or squirrels. And there are several alternatives. This is one scenario. You have this moving front continuous wave. You have the far distance event like whoop, or you have small local populations then expanding out or then emerging of small and local and large populations. So there's really no evidence for this moving front. And these are all possible scenarios where you've got little small pockets where they subsequently expanded from. So where did those little pockets come from? Well, obviously from long distance dispersal from last glacial maximum refugia in Spain, Italy, the Balkans, or local micro refugia, things we're discovering today, or cryptic refugia in Central Eastern and Northern Europe. So these are the range of trees of taxa that we now have evidence that they were growing in these micro refugia in Central Eastern or Northern Europe. And so in the case of beech, the green is its present day distribution and the blue are all the circles where it appears to have had small local refugia. So our current model is we have trees in the Mediterranean and then the smaller populations coming up very close to the ice sheet. So this is the view I was taught as a student that you had. This is a, from north to south in Europe. You have the mountains and then tundra to the north and the south. And in this narrow zone between the ice and the dry, a local montane zone of trees. And we now know, in fact, we have that, but we then also have scattered trees further north in the uh, tundra environment. So this is what they might look like. This is an example in Sichuan, uh, where you've got little water soaks and Pizia crassifolia is growing, or in Alaska, scattered white spruce Pizia glauca. So this is really the scenario, trees all over the place and then spreading out. And when you allow for these micro refugia, then of course our rates of spread uh, become less, but they're still pretty spectacular, a thousand meters per year for things like corals. So what are the evolutionary and ecological implications? Firstly, we see that all the trees show this individualistic pattern of spread. So none of Darwin's keeping together. Each taxon has responded individually and the forest vegetation of North America and Europe has no history longer than about 10,000 years. Tropical vegetation has also experienced substantial change and there's also been rapid mixing of for example, mammals and beetles. So present day terrestrial and freshwater communities have no long history. Communities are broken up, reformed in different configurations repeatedly. And marine organisms, although our, the fossil record is much less well known, has similarly been highly mobile on spatial scales of whole oceans. And this is a rather complicated diagram from Keith Bennett, but this is uh, north to south. Now, some trees uh, basically, and this is time, started in the south, came north, and then, sorry, whoopsie. Whereas other trees started in the south, went north, but then retreated again. And others came in late, went north, and then went south. But the important thing is that they never lost their roots, so to speak, in the south. And that's why that great gorge I showed you in Greece, where you could still see these trees today. Whereas in North America, where you 
haven't got mountains running across uh, west east the southern edge moved northwards as well as the northern edge and so this gives a different genetic picture of north american trees compared with european trees and it's the failure of species southern populations to survive for some reason is what would cause extinction from the earth and the west east orientation of the southern and central european mountains is unlikely to have led to loss of many tertiary species the greater rate of extinction in europe relative to north america is more a function there was a smaller area available for survival of residual populations south of the ice so tree diversity biodiversity today is a result in part of quaternary history so conclusions the eldridge gould view of long periods of little change with brief periods of rapid change and Steve Gould's ecological moments, geological time and macroevolution and mass extinctions. And all this got challenged by my former student Keith Bennett who wrote this wonderful book Evolution and Ecology, The Pace of Life and he su su suggested that if these Milankovitch cycles have been going on throughout Earth's history, they've always been causing disruption genetically and of species distributions. And as species responded individually to changes forced by Milankovitch cycles, they would have, in the Quaternary, they would have responded in the same way in pre-Quaternary Milankovitch cycles. And these cycles affect Earth on timescales much longer than the generation times of any organisms. So ecolog over ecological time with a relatively stable climate, adaptation and microevolution by natural selection may take place. But as the climate changes in response to Milankovitch cycles, the communities break up and new communities are formed. So therefore the adaptations that accumu have accumulated are likely to be lost unless they're particularly useful. Gene pools are thus being constantly stirred up by these temporarily separated populations. So gradualistic speciation is thus very difficult. So the Quaternary record has us, gives us very little evidence for rates of macroevolution being higher than in earlier geological periods. So orbital forcing of climate undoes much of any evolutionary progress that's accumulated at this microevolutionary level. Mass extinctions will, of course, undo it all, uh, but in general, it's Milankovitch that is stirring things up and we lose our records. So Keith provided this additional level, the Milankovitch level, to 20, 100,000 years, disruption, loss of accumulated microevolutionary changes and not confined to the paternity. So the Milankovitch level is the missing level in Gould's original analysis. So this reinforces their concept of punctuated equilibrium, but it makes it more difficult to maintain the hypothesis of Darwin that processes that you could see today build up into evolutionary trends. So the quaternary instability may not have led to increased speciation, most species appear to predate the Quaternary. No evidence, convincing evidence for macroevolution, but of course for microevolution as may have occurred. So Milankovitch cycles are the main cause of stasis. Now, much can be learned from the Quaternary record. So back to the, the conundrum. Here we have the biotic responses in Quaternary time. Distribution changes, high rates of population turnover, changes in abundance or richness, extinctions, nothing much, extermination, adaptation, who knows, speciation, who knows, and stasis. So the responses that we see over the last in the Quaternary are varied, dynamic, complex, and individualistic, and will probably continue to be in the future. And interglacial glacial records show that 
the responses were mainly the brain shifts, the redistribution of species genera families, but rarely any blanket or partial extinctions. So vegetation types have no convincing modern analog today, and that will probably be the same in the future. So a combined use of quaternary results and molecular techniques could well help understand rates and thresholds and provide independent tests of models and predictions in the future. So there's great promise for ancient DNA studies if they're used as a paleogenetic research tool rather than simply as paleochemistic tools. So the Quaternary Ice Age, popular to current opinion, were not periods of major speciation or extinction, but were periods of evolutionary stasis and extensive changes in range dynamics. So we need really to consider both quaternary time and deep time to understand the conundrum of quaternary botany and the evolutionary legacies of the Ice Ages. And there are many exciting potential links in the future between Q time, deep time, molecular phylogeography and evolutionary biology. And modern ecologists, biogeographers, global change biologists have much to learn in my mind, but of course I'm biased from quaternary studies and from each other. And the challenge for people like myself is to present our results and conclusions in a form that ecologists and biogeographers will look at and read. So the responses of plants and vegetation in the quaternary are indeed a conundrum in terms of underlying evolutionary processes, big conundrum, and ecological processes, a smaller conundrum. So I would just end by acknowledging various people, former students, my wife, close colleagues, and sadly some friends, Jim Ritchie, Bill Watts, Herb Wright, who are no longer with us. So, Thank you very much for listening. Uh, John, thank you very much for this excellent talk. Um, it um, inspired, uh, in my mind, three questions or three um, issues that uh, uh, come to the fore. First of all, uh, what you presented is basically, a, it applies to the Northern Hemisphere, glaciated areas. It would be very interesting in the future uh, for someone present the the situation how what we know about what happened in the tropics this is one the second that comes to mind is uh, what sort of message a modeler who works today with climate change and its impacts on um, species distribution species um, uh, threats to existence can take as a take-home message. And finally, uh, when we look at your uh, the, 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 the issue that the current vegetation outside of the tropics uh, in Europe, North America, rarely has a, a longer history than 10,000 years, then comes the question of what exactly are we trying to, to conserve when we, we live in this climatically, climate-driven, uh, dynamic uh, world. Now, uh, I would like to open now the um, the, the, the floor for a, an additional 10 minutes. I, I know we are running slightly late. It's my fault. I, I made a botched attempt to check out the system uh, too close to starting time. So if you don't mind, um, we could have another 10 minutes where people who listened in could post their comments or questions. Well, my, I can give you some comments to your three points, Laszlo. Okay. Uh, okay. The tropics, I agree, it's just we can't imagine what is really going on. It, you know, it's going to be the great area of 
developments and new ideas. Uh, the modelers, they were actually partly responsible for creating the phrase quaternary conundrum. It was originally proposed by a modeler, Dan Botkin, because their model suggested one thing and the paleo record showed another. And I think it simply shows that a nature is more complicated than the model suggested. Uh, Christian Kerner, for example, has shown that very varied microclimate there is on a mountain top, and the modelers who were predicting things were going extinct were, of course, using climate data at a much coarser scale. So I think the modelers really sort of don't like our findings. But actually, ecologists like Christian Kerner are showing very much that there is vegetation and species have much greater resilience than I think we've given credit to. As for what we're trying to conserve, eh, that's, that's a, a, a gigantic question that I'm not really qualified to comment when, in fact, as is, we know, there's very little that's any any great antiquity, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, I'm still waiting for questions, comments. Um, okay, there is a, uh, John, there is a question from Des Thompson. Uh, it says, uh, do you have a view on comments about likely high rates of species extinction looking ahead in the face of climate heating? Well, one of my colleagues in Bergen, Jon Arvid Gittners, has done a lot of work on resurveying, like the sort of stuff that Louise Ross did in the Highlands. Uh, and he surveyed with colleagues in the Alps about 300 summits and you know, with your historical data. And I'm glad to say that although uh, sort of dwarf shrubs are coming up the hills, coming up the mountains, nothing so far, fortunately, has fallen off the top. So uh, just what scale of extinction there's going to be, how much of it is due to the micro environment that Christian Kerner and so on have emphasized. But of course, I'm here, I'm only talking about plant stairs. I, birds, I realize, are very different. Yeah, it's a very interesting point that you, you raised in this last sentence, because people who, who study interactions between plants and animals, they, um, they are in a in a different situation slightly from uh, looking at uh, uh, plants only. Okay, uh, last chance for one more question or a uh, comment. Nobody? Nobody from the modeling community? Well, in that case, I would like to, to thank uh, Professor Burks very much for this inspiring talk. And uh, we do hope that to keep in contact. And uh, if the, uh, anyone in the audience today or who will be accessing this broadcast has any questions, I am sure that uh, uh, Professor Burks will be open to uh, engage in a conversation. So I would like to thank uh, John very much again your excellent uh, presentation thank you, thank you. I, am I am going to, going to uh, end the broadcast, the broadcast now, now.